No, I'm not going to. Great. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for this oral evidence session for our Conservatism and Human Rights project. Um, as you know, Bright Blue is an independent think tank for liberal conservatism, and this is a year-long inquiry where we're looking at three particular elements. The first is how we might tackle discrimination, whether it be sexual, racial, gender, disability, religious, uh, and how we might tackle it in ways which are attractive to centre-right thinking. The second is around uh, foreign policy and the role of uh, human rights in foreign policy and what more Britain could be doing in, in leading the world on that. Uh, and thirdly, around um, the British Bill of Rights, the proposed British Bill of Rights, uh, the proposed uh, scrapping of the Human Rights Act uh, and, uh, and the importance of the European Convention on Human Rights. So obviously this session is particularly focused on that third element. To say that you're being filmed, some of your comments will be tweeted uh, and there will be a transcript of this which will appear in the final report uh, by our commissioners. Um, our commissioners include Dominic Grieve, Maria Miller, Caroline Spellman, Lord Finkelstein, uh, Matt Dancona and Benedict Rogers uh, and we'll be entering a stage of policy formulation sessions and this session will feed into that so we will be taking these ideas into it. But to say, obviously, we'll make it clear that you are independent, you don't necessarily endorse the report's findings that we have at the end, and that you are independent experts. So perhaps I could start just by introducing us. So this is Nigel Fletcher, who's our Head of Research at Bright Blue. I'm Ryan Shorthouse, the Director. Kate Maltby, who's an Associate Fellow at Bright Blue, and James Dobson, who's our researcher. Uh, and together we are uh, pulling together uh, this final report that commissioners will be uh, signing off. Perhaps we can start by if you could just introduce yourselves uh, and your organisation uh, and I suppose your introductory marks, uh, remarks on this theme. So we'll start with Edward. Uh, I'm Edward Folks, Lord Folks, um, QC. I am a practising barrister and a member of the House of Lords. Until this July I was also Justice Minister and one of my responsibilities together with Dominic Raab was a British Bill of Rights. I was also on the Commission on a Bill of Rights uh, set up by the Coalition Government and quite a lot of my practice has been concerned with human rights cases. Martha. So I'm Martha Spurrier, I am now the Director of Liberty, I've been in post for five months and before then I was a barrister, mainly specialising in human rights law, a legal aid lawyer specialising in human rights law. Um, opening remarks? Or yes, if you'd like yes. to well, I just, I'll reflect on just a few things, but I'm going to stick very rigidly to the three minutes that I know we've been allotted. So I think one thing is just to set out my stall of where I come from on these issues. So obviously I studied law and I studied human rights um, and I've practiced as a lawyer and I now am a human rights campaigner. But I have to say that where my views are largely formed is as someone who's just represented a lot of people um, who have suffered human rights abuses. And that has been the most... Um, informative experience of really understanding why these issues are, are, even though they are very interesting political and academic issues, why they are also just fundamentally very important issues for everyday <coughs> citizens. And so those people include the hard cases, like people in police custody or prisons or immigration removal centres, but they also include the easier cases, like victims of domestic violence and rape and victims of trafficking and disabled children and people in care homes and people in psychiatric care. And I think my overall reflection is that if there was one thing <laughs> that I could do with this debate, it would just be to take the toxicity out of it. I think that the time has come to put an end to toxic rhetoric around human rights. I think it is irresponsible. I think it is often inaccurate. And I think we are at a particularly interesting time in history, in this country, in Europe, in America, and if we can't recognise now that there is a very real risk that politics of fear and division and isolation might be winning, then I don't think we will ever quite recognise that. And I think it, is never more, it has never been more important to try and align around some very fundamental things. Now there are always going to be arguments about the operation of human rights. I think whether you're talking about a Human Rights Act or a British Bill of Rights or any other kind of 
instrument that is dealing with that very difficult balancing act of collective interests and individual interests, there are going to be arguments about it. But I think there has to be some agreement around the fundamentals, the rule of law, rights for minorities in a majoritarian democracy, accountability for people in power, and the values of equality and fairness and dignity. I think any move to diminish rights protection now is dangerous. I think the Bill of Rights agenda is not one that is going to be Human Rights Act plus. And I think that the very, very real risk is that the process of repealing the Human Rights Act will undermine rights for ordinary people, will push the Union to the brink of breakup, particularly with the issues around Northern Ireland and Scotland, unlike the Human Rights Act, will not receive cross-party support and so won't have that kind of arguably constitutional status that the Human Rights Act has, and also won't necessarily achieve public buy-in because, of course, we know from polling that Dominic Reeve talked a lot about at the Conservative Party conference two years ago, that actually the suggestion that everyone thinks that human rights are toxic and just for terrorists and paedophiles and rapists is not borne out in people's views, that there is a, a large swathe of people who don't know what human rights are and don't understand how they're applied. So Amnesty, for example, have just done some polling which showed that two-thirds of people had no idea that the Human Rights Act had anything to do with the Hillsborough Inquest. And also the polling suggests that when people are asked about it, it's actually only a hardcore of 20% of people who are very against human rights. So I think the very real danger, coming back to the toxicity point, is that we lose something that's very precious, that is in fact not as unpopular as everyone says it is, and that in the process of doing so, we lose standing on the international stage, and we jeopardise values here, which are already under very real threat. Okay, thank you, Mark. So, Lord folks, if I could ask a question around um, government intention. So we know now that the new Secretary of State for Justice has, uh, has confirmed that we will be going ahead with the British Bill of Rights, uh, but also that the Prime Minister has said that we will remain a signatory to the European Convention of Human Rights. Do you think it's right that uh, the government is doing that? Uh, and if so, what should be in this new British Bill of Rights, which is different to the Human Rights Act? <clears throat> the government's got quite a lot on its plate at the moment. Whether um, any plans they have in relation to the human rights act are immediate, I rather doubt. Um, I was originally of the view that I wasn't really quite sure that we needed the Human Rights Act at all when it first came in. I thought a combination of courts being quick off the mark and Parliament should be able to protect our human rights without the European Convention. Not that I have anything against the European Convention, it seems to be a pretty reasonable statement of what anybody might identify as fundamental rights. Um, we've had real difficulties with the Human Rights Act. I entirely accept what Martha says, that there's by no means agreement on this. Uh, I think, in fact, we've reached a position where it's the problems that we had with it are not quite as acute as they were. One reason for that is that the judges' enthusiasm in this country has slightly diminished for the Human Rights Act. Doesn't mean to say they don't value human rights, but the Strasbourg jurisprudence, which I think had too much of an influence, has rather less of an influence now. There's a quite constant um, repetition by the uh, Supreme Court that we must not mustn't forget the common law. We mustn't forget other sources of law. Uh, also, I think we're very rarely in breach of um, any convention rights. We don't cause much problem in Strasbourg at the moment. I think the, the judges in Strasbourg welcome our participation in the process of clarifying what might be the appropriate uh, approach to various different issues. Um, and I think there is a genuine dialogue, to use the word that the judges use, between the courts. So I don't think things are at their most acute. Whether that will always be the case, one cannot guarantee because of the, it depends very much on the uh, appointment of the judges in Strasbourg. Fairly benign from our point of view at the moment, not necessarily the case for the future. We don't have any control of that. All you need is to be a jury's consult, uh, which doesn't mean to say you're an experienced judge. And of course, the various uh, members of the Council of Europe have vastly different experiences. So it's uncertain. Um, I think you wanted to know what, if anything, we should be doing by way of a British Bill of Rights. Uh, I think that the process of leaving the Convention would 
uh, would, would weaken our position internationally to some extent, leaving any human rights um, convention doesn't quite send out the right message, isn't consistent with our traditions. And also the, um, the Strasbourg court would lose, just as I've said, quite a positive influence in terms of our input. Um, but of course, we would remain bound by obligations once we're part of this, if, if we remain part of the convention. So this would not be the clean break that many on the right of our party want to achieve. So any British Bill of Rights would be still subject to our being taken to Strasbourg. I, I do think there are some sensible changes that could be made in the Human Rights Act. Um, I won't elaborate all of them, apart from anything else, I would be giving away um, important uh, secrets which uh, may or may not ever come to light in terms of the work that I did for about six months uh, in the Ministry of Justice. But I think, for example, we could focus on um, Section 2 and the extent to which courts in this country should have regard to uh, the Strasbourg jurisprudence. On one view, they've really overdone it, and I think most of the judges now accept they've overdone it. But I think we need to make clearer that while Strasbourg can be a source of, um, of help in interpreting convention rights, it's by no means the only source and we shouldn't be bound by decisions we find quite honestly not helpful. I think we must think again about Section 3, uh, the obligation to interpret legislation so that it complies with the, um, with, with the Human Rights Act. That's been taken as a, uh, very often as an opportunity to wrench around the meaning of statutes so as to comply with sometimes some not terribly good decisions from Strasbourg. I think we should be interpreting statutes in the way that they were intended to, uh, um, <coughs> in the way that, they, that we, we would normally interpret a statute, what's its natural and ordinary meaning. Um, I think we should also be thinking about what constitutes a breach of the Convention. One of the reasons that there was a significant lack of um, enthusiasm in some quarters, not I accept uh, everywhere, for the human right to, is the fact that to establish a breach you don't have any threshold. It doesn't necessarily have to be very serious, although there are serious breaches of human rights. And uh, there is no reflection of responsibilities. I don't think this is, they're, 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 I think we should be thinking seriously of some sort of filter and some sort of threshold so that some of the disaffection which we found in the Commission are widespread for the Human Rights Act would be less likely to continue. Um, and that would perhaps flow into when or whether it was necessary to have a judicial remedy at all. Because very often in Strasbourg, it will be decided that the simple finding of a breach is sufficient rather than providing damages. So I think there's some sensible tidying up we could do which would make it British, not in the sense of isolationist, but something that would, um, would produce a, a document which I think British people felt more associated with. Okay, very interesting. And what is your view, um, Lord Folks, on the recent announcement the Prime Minister made around um, the armed forces and the derogation of the ECHR in situations of armed conflict? <coughs> um, well, I think there are a number of difficulties with it. I don't think it's going to solve the problems that uh, have been found to exist in, in terms of the, um, of the army and, and the other forces potentially finding themselves liable in circumstances which most people would think was inappropriate. First of all, what, what would constitute a, an appropriate situation in which to derogate? You know, it has to be done in advance. Warfare isn't quite what it was in terms of set pieces. Um, I think that actually if we're going to make any difference to some of the unsatisfactory elements of claims against the military, we need to go further. Uh, so I don't think that's enough and I think that, that the government probably is contemplating further steps not necessarily radical steps, but further steps. I think it's just one part of a possible solution. I mean, the other ones, just a very brief summary, would be statutory clarification of combat immunity, for example, and restricting the scope of the Human Rights Act um, territorially. Very interesting. OK, Martha, so, I mean, if the British Bill of Rights isn't going to mean that we are not a signatory of the ECHR, then what is the problem with it? Well, I think there's a number of things. The first is that, of course, it's right to say it's good that the Convention would remain part of 
a British Bill of Rights, although it is disappointing that, for example, we know that Theresa May, in her own words, is not a great fan of the Convention. That doesn't fill me with confidence that this is going to be an, an administration that, through the passage of repealing the Human Rights Act, is going to very carefully enshrine the rights that we all hold dear. So I think that's, a, that's something that everyone should have in the back of their minds as they go into this whole process, if it, if it is borne out, if Brexit doesn't overtake it, or the, or the other government business. Um, so there are a number of problems. Taking it at its sort of lowest, calling it, which I know I'm not quoting Lord Fox, but people have said it's a face-changing exercise, it's a rebrand. If you put the word British in front of it, people will feel like they have more ownership of it, more connection with it. So there's a kind of pragmatic point, which is that I don't think that Parliament should be in the business of rebranding re -branding legislation. Um, I don't think that that is a good use of the legislature's time. Um, I also think it fundamentally dodges the problem. I don't think that changing the title of something will change people's emotional reaction to it. The fact is that what there needs to be is leadership and education about human rights and embedding human rights values into British culture. I don't think you're going to achieve that by using the word British in the legislation. I think you have to make these rights real and practical and understandable for people. And you could just as easily do that with the Human Rights Act as you could with the British Bill of Rights. I also think that actually this talk of face changing, tweaks, tidying up is is misleading about what the process is actually going to entail. So there is, other than potentially adding the right to jury, jury trial, which wouldn't apply in Scotland and wouldn't apply in Northern Ireland and could be done by amending a criminal justice bill, for example, other than that additional right, there is no Conservative politician on record saying that a British Bill of Rights will advance rights protection. So it's not going to be Human Rights Act plus... If it's not going to be Human Rights Act plus, there is a very grave risk that it's going to be Human Rights Act minus. We know, for example, that the government takes positions in litigation routinely trying to advocate for lesser human rights protection. So, for example, the War Boys rapist case, which is being brought, as you know, by victims of the, war boy, of the black cab rapist, is being appealed to the Supreme Court early next year. And the argument there is about the obligations that the police have to investigate rape and sexual violence effectively. And the finding in the High Court and the finding in the Court of Appeal was that there is that obligation under Article 3 and that the Met were systemically failing women because they, were not have, they did not have in place the systems and practices that meant that they could effectively investigate and then prosecute rape. The Home Secretary, then Theresa May, applied to intervene in the Supreme Court case the commissioner was refused, it sounds nitty gritty and legal, but I think it's an indication of the, Met, of the mindset behind this agenda. So the commissioner for the Met appeals to the Supreme Court, gets refused. The Home Secretary then, Theresa May, appeals and says, I want to intervene, and I want to intervene on the grounds that I don't think that Article 3 should give rise to this positive obligation. So that will be heard in due course by the Supreme Court, and they will make their decision on what they think that Article 3 requires. And it wouldn't take a genius to, to guess what I think the position should be in relation to women's rights. But if you have the Home Secretary saying absolutely clearly in her pleadings in the Supreme Court, Article 3 does not contain this positive obligation and should not impose those obligations on the police, and then if you have that Home Secretary becoming Prime Minister, and then if you have conversations with Dominic Raab, which I have had, about how he does want to do things with positive obligations under Article 2, under Article 3, under Article 4 and 8, then you start to see that there is potentially an agenda here which is very, very damaging of human rights indeed. So... We have, heard, we have heard talk, sensible talk, from politicians who are involved in this process that there will be diminishing of positive obligations, and that is the Hillsborough families, and that is the war boys' victims, and that is the victims of trafficking that Theresa May champions. Also, that there will be changes to deportation rules, particularly allowing people to be deported to countries where they will face violations of Articles 5 and 6, and also that there will be changes made to territorial application, perhaps trailed by this policy that you've already alluded to, Ryan. So I, I think it is wrong to say that there is not a very strong lobby behind this agenda to say that they will use this opportunity to diminish rights protection, and that even if that is not the agenda of everybody, there is a very real risk that if you open up that conversation in Parliament, that is what will end up happening. Even on the tidying up measures, like Section 2, have regard to Strasbourg jurisprudence doesn't mean blindly follow it regardless. If there has been a problem, 
with judicial interpretation of Section 2, that can be dealt with either by the government producing guidance on it or by the government making those arguments in the cases where they feel that the judges go too far. I have argued so many cases where I have tried to get the judges to follow Strasbourg case law or the case law from other international courts and the judges have politely declined not to do so. They, They do that absolutely routinely. In relation to the threshold, just very briefly on that, Article 3 breaches, of course, have to be proved beyond reasonable doubt, so that's a very high threshold indeed. And all other breaches have to be proven on the balance of probabilities, which is the same standard that you apply in all civil proceedings. So, again, if there is a problem with threshold, which I don't believe there is, I think that's entirely appropriate that the most serious violation should face the most serious hurdle, just like in criminal proceedings. But if there is that problem, that is not a principled reason for scrapping the entire scheme of the Human Rights Act, opening up this very dangerous conversation and signalling to everybody that human rights may not be a priority for this government, may be something that you can play fast and loose with. And like I say, domestically and on the international stage, I think that's a very dangerous message. Okay, thank you, Martha. What we've heard from um, commissioners will uh, no doubt have other questions in a second, but um, I'd like to add one, which is we've heard today um, on issues around discrimination, um, uh, and there's been a general consensus, which is that the legislative framework is there for protecting people against these uh, discrimination, and actually the real issue is around um, the implementation or the interpretation of it. Do you feel that what we have at the moment, and this is a question to both of you, is adequate in terms of protecting human rights, the the framework that we have in this country? Or do you think there there is something more that we could have in specific areas? Um, I'm not an expert in, in discrimination law, but I think it's quite an interesting sort of point of principle arises from that. Because my view is that actually Parliament, uh, and if necessary the court, should be legislating in a much more subtle and specific and nuanced way. One of my problems with the Convention, fine and dandy though it is in general terms, is that it is very loose and unspecific, and it makes it rather difficult to... Uh, sometimes to predict outcomes, which is very good for lawyers, but not very clear for either for lawyers or for public authorities as to what it means. Let me just give you one simple example. Of course, slavery is one of those, those things which is outlawed by the Convention. Who would disagree with that? But the modern Slavery Act was produced by Parliament as a specific response to a particular problem. I think that it is for Parliament and for the courts to deal much more specifically rather than relying on these general rights which are difficult to interpret. Martha? Well, I think you can always have conversations about the sort of human rights utopia. So I think people will always want to and should be talking about, as a, as a matter of democratic dialogue, whether we've got enough rights protection in many different areas. So whether that's children's rights or the rights of people who, are, who have mental health problems. And we have many international treaties that we can look to for inspiration. I don't think, however, that that we are at the stage where we can say we want to be incorporating all those obligations into a hard-edged legislative framework in this country. I think we have a very good framework in the Human Rights Act and that there can be a quite separate conversation about other rights protections deriving from other international obligations. I think the Equality Act is a very interesting example. I see the Equality Act and the Human Rights Act as really actually very similar pieces of progressive legislation. And I think it is interesting, it's, a, it's culturally interesting and politically interesting that it is the Human Rights Act that is this deeply contra- controversial instrument, at least in Westminster, but I don't think any party would ever suggest repealing the Equality Act. And actually I think the principles behind both of them are d- d- derived from the same mentality, which is of course why when you're bringing Human Rights Act cases you're often running Equality Act arguments at, at the same time. Um, so I think what would be... What would be great is if we could say we have a good framework in the Equality Act and we have a good framework in the Human Rights Act, but of course having good legislative frameworks is not the whole answer, and you then do need to look at the business of operation and enforcement and, and like I say, embedding these values into culture. And that that is the next chapter, I think, of human rights and equality in this country. Um, Just just on that, I mean, it is worth, I suppose, saying the Equality Act did actually repeal a lot of previous qualities legislation in order to um, put it into one um, combined act. So as, really, as part of that process there was a discussion. I wonder whether the way it's been talked about 
sort of rebranding is a similar exercise. It's an opportunity to tidy up. But on the specific issue that we've heard um, throughout the day, actually, about the clash of rights um, between where, for example, freedom of expression um, clashes with uh, freedom of religious belief and the, um, the Cake case in Northern Ireland, for example. Um, I just wonder whether the opportunity of sort of, of drafting new legislation and going back to Lord Fox's point there about interpretation and being more specific, whether things like that could be actually clarified in terms of, well, how the courts decide um, between different um, rights in that regard is something which a, a British Bill of Rights might be able to give a bit more clarity on in terms of what principles should, should guide that in terms of balancing them. Is that not something that could be added in? Um, I think it is, and I think it's, it's one of the factors that uh, we could indeed learn from experience because I'm sure Martha would agree that not every case involving the Human Rights Act has reflected very well on anybody in terms of the sense of its outcome. I mean, we, I think there's a danger that we can treat the Human Rights Act as it's some sort of perfect vessel. It was a piece of legislation which was introduced immediately after the Labour Party came into power in 1997. There was no green paper, there was no white paper, there was no proper consultation. And uh, it's a brilliant piece of drafting but uh, it was a very brave step. Nobody quite knew what would happen. I gave lectures as to what I thought might happen, people did, and almost all of them were wrong in terms of the uh, significance of it. Many people thought it would have only minor effect on our law. They said because we really comply with all these things anyway. It's proved to be very, very different. And I think the idea that you cannot touch it because you are in some way interfering with rights protection and all the vocabulary that goes with that is wrong. We, you know, we should be prepared to look at things to see whether experience tells, them, tells us that they, should, uh, they need alteration. So, um, and I do think that one of the suggestions you make about balancing these things is sensible to reflect our experience of case law. I think th the difficulty is there is a slight air of unreality about this kind of conversation. Human rights are about clashes of rights. They are they balance constantly. They are operational tools. They're not you know they're often spoken about as being tools for lawyers or but they're not. They're actually tools for public servants to navigate really really complicated human situations. Which is why you have the most senior police officer in Northern Ireland saying that he very much likes the Human Rights Act because it means he can say to his officers who have to police probably the most politically charged complicated protests that happen on these islands that he can say to them, when someone comes to you and says, I want to have a parade on this route doing these things, you need to first think, is it necessary, is it proportionate, and is it an interference of their rights if I'm going to say, actually, you've got to go a different route, or you can't wear that colour, or you can't beat that drum. That gives those police officers a framework within which to deal with a very complicated situation. And then, of course, a defence if someone then says, I don't like the decision you made about how you're policing my protest, because they can say, well, here are all our reasons. We went through this very rational process to decide how to deal with your rights versus the rights of the community that don't agree with you. So the problem is when you talk about drafting into legislation the specifics of how a judge should balance Article 8 and Article 10, or Article 8 and Article 6, or Article 5 and the obligation to provide offending behaviour courses. The point about legislation is that it gives judges the principled framework that Parliament has decided to then use applying that to a different set of facts every time. And the boundary will be drawn differently depending on those facts. So. I, I really struggle to see how even the best draftsman in the world could say, we're going to give you more than saying, because if you look at the structure of these qualified rights, they give you what you need. So you look at Article 8, and you have, this is, this is your right, you've got a right to a family life, you've got a right to a private life. This right can be interfered with in the following circumstances, and that it is the interest of national security, it is the protection of public health and morals, and then is that interference necessary, proportionate, and, and consistent with a democratic society? To me, that is a very specific framework for any judicial decision maker or public official to go through to work out what the right outcome is in terms of human rights. And I just don't know, without trespassing on how to apply those principles to the different facts, I don't know how you would clarify that anymore. And I don't think it's not working, because I think you see 
judges and public officials, like I say, navigate these very complicated human situations day in, day out, whether they work in hospitals or whether they work in the police force, whether they work in the classroom. And they do manage to balance those rights. And every now and again, someone thinks they've drawn the line in the, right, in the wrong place, and so they take a case about it. And that's always going to be the case with human rights. You're never going to get rid of that because some people are going to disagree because this stuff is really fundamental and important to people. So uh, that's why I say there's an air of unreality. I, I don't understand how that could ever be achieved. And I don't, even, I don't even think it's necessarily something we should say that we want. I think we want a clear framework and that's what we have. And then we want people applying that framework accurately and transparently. And we have that as well. And we also have, of course, currently in the Human Rights Act, I mean, the freedom of expression has been mentioned, but we have in Section 12 a steer, effectively, an interpretive steer, that when you are balancing Article 10 with any other article of the Convention, you must give particular consideration to the primacy of freedom of expression. And if you look at what Article 10 has done for journalism and done for the free press and done for open justice, it has been a huge success story. Now, of course, there are always going to be questions about press regulation and the media are always going to want to have even more free reign and people who lie on beaches with their clothes off don't want to be photographed and that's going to be your tension and you're always going to have it and it's the same with libel and it's the same with court reporting restrictions. But the fact is we have seen since the HRA has been in force, we have seen journalists for the first time have an enforceable right to freedom of expression, which didn't exist in the common law, just wasn't there. And they have done that to protect the confidentiality of their sources. They have, so for example, the Suzanne Breen case, where a woman who was, didn't have to disclose her, the details of her interviews with the real IRA to the police because it would have put her life at risk. We, we see it time and again, the David Miranda case, the stop and search under Se Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. That was an Article 10 case. It was David Miranda saying, I'm a journalist and I have free expression rights and, and you infringe them. So to me, that's all working fine within the acceptance that this is always going to be controversial stuff because it's the bread and butter of complex daily life. Um, I absolutely uh, fail to understand some of that because the problem with the Human Rights Act very often is it doesn't provide a very specific framework. And you have hospitals, and I've seen hospital guidance, I've seen police force guidance, and they are struggling to make sense of how they reflect, for example, in a hospital context, what their clinical approach is, with some rather vague concept of protecting everybody's human rights. Uh, similarly with the police, I remember doing a case which went to what we now call the Supreme Court. The police force had tried to reflect and guidance to officers what they should or should not be doing. They found it very difficult because they were looking at Strasbourg judgments, which had been half borrowed by the courts. It simply wasn't the framework which uh, Martha says that it was, which is easy to understand. Of course she is right that there are going to be difficult decisions to make for a difficult balancing exercise for public authorities, but I don't think the Human Rights Act is, is in any way helpful very often in helping them decide these things. James? Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the um, kind of practicalities of implicating a British Bill of Rights. So I've seen some suggestion that it would be difficult to repeal the Human Rights Act in Scotland and Northern Ireland. It would be even more difficult to introduce a new British Bill of Rights where the devolved parliaments could legislate themselves. Is that is that a big barrier to introducing a British Bill of Rights? And is it desirable to have different rights structures in the United Kingdom? Is that somewhere we're going to move to, to a more federalist approach? Is that could we do that? Would it would it look good? Um, I think it is quite a problem. I mean, it's quite sort of politically sensitive, and um, there have already been conversations, I can say, without giving too much away along those lines, and uh, there is scope for agreement, or perhaps not for agreement in that respect. So I don't underestimate that. I mean, the, in Northern Ireland, there are problems with the Good Friday Agreement, and the, the, on the whole, Scotland seems to be reasonably happy with the Human Rights Act. Um, there, there are, there are, ultimately, we can do what we want. But um, I hope we would, if, if this goes ahead in some way, we can reach some suitable accommodation with um, all uh, the other members of the Euro United Kingdom, apart from England and Wales. So I, I don't think um, I don't think that there is an answer to the devolution question. I think there's a good reason why no one has yet suggested that there is a clear answer, and I know that a lot of lawyers have been churned through trying to get the drafting right on this issue. 
The Good Friday Agreement, of course, the Human Rights Act is a really central plank of that. And the consensus among lawyers is that unpick the Good Friday Agreement, which is what would happen if you remove the Human Rights Act, do that at your peril. I was in Northern Ireland last week. I met with the majority of the political parties up there. They are absolutely clear um, that repealing the Human Rights Act would undermine the Good Friday Agreement. Sinn Féin are very supportive of the Human Rights Act. The DUP, I think, are probably split on the issue, so I think you can have conversations about how the politics would go um, in Northern Ireland, but I think unquestionably it would be damaging for the peace process. I don't think anyone disagrees about that there. And, of course, it would fuel the conversations about whether there should be a United Ireland separate from England, and those conversations are already happening because of Brexit. And the same with Scotland. Again, I have met with all of the main parties there, including both Labour and the SNP, and they are absolutely clear that they would not give legislative consent to the Human Rights Act. So it isn't just a case of we can do what we want. The result potentially then is a twin track or three track human rights protection system. That I think is constitutionally completely incoherent. Um, there are all kinds of practical implications that would be unworkable. And also I think it then that is the first step in the road to breaking up the union. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so the final question that I want to ask you is that the, the, the purpose of the Commission is to suggest policies, uh, and in particular, uh, suggest policies around the proposed British Bill of Rights. So if you were sort of gunning for a, a few policies that we would recommend, what would they be? Um, and the other thing to just alert you to is the fact that we are uh, bringing out a paper um, on what should be in the British Bill of Rights, which will be out in January, and uh, Michael Tugendat, um, who is a um, former QC uh, and High Court judge, is, is writing that. So please, uh, uh, there's still uh, an opportunity to input into that. Um, so it would be good to get your thoughts, but um, it would be interesting to hear them now on record. So perhaps I can go to you first, Martha. Mm. Can I just clarify, when you say the policies, do you mean... Do you mean what you would like to see in a British Bill of Rights, or do you mean the sort of surrounding architecture of a human rights regime? Well, I think I know your answer to whether we should have a British yeah, Bill of yeah. Rights. Uh, so I think it's the latter. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a very interesting question. So I think, um, I think there is definitely scope for human rights education. Um, I think, I know that's something that's been talked about before, there was a move to take it off the curriculum and it remains on the curriculum, but I think there is, and there are people who will be much, much better qualified to talk about this than I am, but all I will say is that I think there is an interesting piece of work around citizenship, effectively, or whatever, it's probably called something different now, um, to do with people understanding human rights and their place in history, and also equalities and equalities law. So that, I think, is something that can be done. Um, and I also think then there is a piece of work around the operational use of human rights. So I think one of the interesting things when you look back at much that was written around the introduction of the Human Rights Act um, is how it was seen then as this operational tool. And I think more learning, more profile given to the fact that it is this flexible instrument that is designed to try and manage situations of the powerful and the slightly less powerful, or the powerful and the powerless, I think that would be helpful. So that means working with the police. If it is right that there are some police officers who find it very difficult to manage, then I, I don't think, like I said, I don't think the answer is throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think the answer is, OK, well, let's train them and let's have these conversations. And I think also then there is a work, piece of work around communities and community engagement, particularly given things like the rise in hate crime, given the operation of the prevent strategy and the reporting that we're hearing, that that is giving rise to division rather than unity in communities. So I would say education, operational work, particularly around what public servants are having to do in their daily lives, and then outreach with communities. Thank you, Martha. Lord Fergus. Um, I think you heard from me in general terms what I think might be useful to put in a British yes. Bill of Rights, so I probably need not repeat that. Um, I'm not sure that the Human Rights Act or a British Bill of Rights, as it might become, should be specifically targeted as, the, uh, as something that people should be educated about. But there are a lot, I think, advising, um, educating people about their essential rights in all sorts of uh, contexts is probably useful and would be part of any citizen's um, learning about society and what his or her place in it is. But I think, I think we must be careful that 
just as the Human Rights Act should not be elevated, the British Bill of Rights should not be considered to be the entire content of all our rights or you know, the answer to everything. It, it wouldn't be. Uh, it's, um, and I think, a slight historical accident that we may end up getting a British Bill of Rights because we have the Human Rights Act and because of the various political reasons. It's difficult to get rid of it entirely and to leave the Strasbourg Court, possibly for good reasons. We are where we are. We're, we're not going to get rid of those rights. Uh, and uh, we should um, be a bit more confident about them, explain them that they are British. We have understood it. We've, we've learned some lessons. And uh, we can now say that this is a, an act which reflects our values now. Uh, it takes into account not entirely Strasbourg, but other wisdom from elsewhere and reflects the, the values that we um, have at the moment, um, which, uh, um, w which of course would be things that people should know about. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very rich and useful discussion and plenty of ideas that we'll probably come back to you both on. Um, uh, and it's, as I said, it's going to be a sort of four, five month process now with the Commission coming up with ideas and specifically in this area as well. So we will be in touch. But just to say thank you very much for your time uh, and your thoughts. Very, very grateful. Thank you. Okay.